I'm Rusty Brown, I'm a professor of radiology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and we're going to be talking about ultrasound of adnexal masses. Uh, we're going to review um, ovarian masses primarily. First, we'll talk about the normal ovary and several things that really should not be considered or reported as a mass. We'll talk about common benign masses, neoplasms, and particularly the uh, most important indicators of malignancy. We'll review some extra ovarian masses, and a lot of the recommendations and criteria that we'll talk about are uh, based on the SRU consensus conference on adnexal cysts and other masses, um, and the recommendations will be for asymptomatic patients. First of all, let's review the normal ovary. Um, the ovary is unique in that it has small cysts, which are really follicles, as part of its normal structure. Uh, we know these follicles get up to, on average, about two to two and a half almost centimeters at ovulation. From the consensus conference, we considered the follicles up to three centimeters in maximum diameter to be normal in premenopausal women, and we just consider that a dominant follicle. You do not want to report those as cysts. The corpus luteum is another normal structure that we see after ovulation. The typical appearance is, is in this one where you have a cystic lesion with kind of a thick crenulated wall, some internal echoes. If you put on cholera power Doppler, it's often a vascular rim. That's quite typical. These are usually less than two to three centimeters in maximum diameter. And this is just a typical appearance of a corpus luteum that we expect to see after ovulation. Uh, and we don't want to report these as abnormal or masses that need follow-up. Occasionally you may not be sure about one, but most cases they have a characteristic enough appearance um, that you can be confident. Uh, I'd just like to mention the word cyst. I, I think it's problematic when we use the word cyst uh, in the ovary since we do have these uh, follicles that are normal and they appear basically as a simple cyst uh, that we would describe as a cyst in any other organ. The problem with the ovary is uh, it can be misinterpreted by our clinical colleagues, uh, it can be misinterpreted by patients uh, who now often can see the reports in many institutions. So I would encourage you to try not to use the word cyst for any structure in an ovary that you think is normal. So these dominant follicles, I would just call them a dominant follicle. If it's the corpus luteum, I prefer not to use the word even corpus luteum cyst, just call it a corpus luteum. Even multiple follicles or physiologic cysts, I think, can be misunderstood. Normal is a great word. I would encourage you just to use normal. Or I'll often, when it's a cyst, um, a dominant follicle, that is, that getting close to three centimeters, just say normal ovary with a dominant follicle measuring X, or normal ovary with a corpus luteum, and just try not to use that word cyst because it can be so misunderstood. What about the normal postmenopausal ovary? Often they're small and homogeneous like this. It makes it even harder sometimes to be confident that what you're looking at is truly the ovary. But you can see small cysts, and these probably are not follicles in the postmenopausal ovary, so I would call them cysts in this patient population. We know that about 20% of postmenopausal women have small, simple cysts, that is less than about a centimeter, and these are considered uh, of no clinical importance. That was a recommendation from the SRU consensus conference also. So if you have this simple cyst in a postmenopausal patient that's less than a centimeter, you could ignore it, or if you want to describe it, you could just say it's uh, considered of no clinical uh, importance in a postmenopausal patient. So in general, the things that are normal and that we really don't want to call attention to and that do not need follow-up are in the premenopausal patient, a follicle less than three centimeters, a corpus luteum, again, I would encourage you not to call these cysts, and in the postmenopausal patient, a simple cyst uh, of a centimeter or less in maximum diameter. I want to mention a couple of other things uh, that you may see in the normal ovary so they're not misinterpreted. These tiny echogenic foci are common. They're typically one to three millimeters. A few of them are pointed out here by the arrows. Sometimes they have no distal artifact. Occasionally there's a short comet tail artifact. They do not typically have acoustic shadowing. Uh, these are common. As best we know, they're clinically insignificant. Uh, different uh, studies have found different causes from calcification to hemosiderin to tiny cysts where we're seeing specular reflectors from the back walls of these tiny cysts. 
regardless of the cause as best we know at this point, they're generally uh, insignificant. I'll admit occasionally they're very extensive in the ovary. Um, there's just a few in this ovary. If they're uh, unusually extensive, I might follow them, but even then, I doubt that they're clinically significant. Aside from these tiny, more common one to three millimeter echogenic foci, you'll occasionally see a larger calcification in the ovary like this. Uh, so these are larger, they're usually five millimeters or more. They do have acoustic shadowing as in this case. So this is different than the more common tiny echogenic foci. What do they mean? Uh, a study from many years ago found that uh, one patient developed a mucin assist adenoma and one patient later developed a dermoid, though it was not clear that it was actually coming from this area of calcification. A later study looked at these uh, calcifications of five millimeters or larger and found really no clinical significance. None of the patients developed tumors during follow-up. One patient had path correlation and it showed calcification in the corpus albicans. So I think in general when you see these isolated coarse calcifications with no associated mass, they're generally of little to no significance. Probably don't need follow-up, but if you are going to follow them, there's really no role for early follow-up. I'd wait at least a year, perhaps two, uh, to follow these. I think it's important not to report these as masses, just as isolated calcification. Uh, and again, generally in my experience, there are little to no clinical significance if there's no associated mass. So that is important to make sure it's not part of a mass. Um, uh, dermoids, sometimes people will consider these. We know that dermoids can get calcification or ossification, uh, but it's unusual for the dermoid just to be a focus of calcification uh, by itself without any other component of a mass. So what's our approach to characterizing adnexal masses? Well, several different uh, attacks have been tried. Uh, subjective assessment is, I think, what many of us use, and it's been shown to work well when done by an experienced examiner. Uh, there are different mathematical models. Uh, there's a risk of malignancy index. There's an adnex uh, mathematical model. Several different uh, ones have been proposed using a combination of ultrasound features, uh, sometimes clinical or laboratory features in addition. The International Ovarian Tumor Analysis, or IOTA group, has also done a lot of work in this area, and they have a simple rules uh, approach that identifies uh, specific sonographic features that predict malignancy, specific ones that predict malignancy, uh, and then if they meet those criteria, uh, you can confidently predict benign or malignant. I think many of us still use the subjective approach. We know what those features are, and we'll review those that indicate benign or malignant uh, cause. And we pretty much, at this point, I rely on subjective assessment. First, I'd like to review the common benign ovarian masses. I kind of call these the big four because this is kind of the bread and butter of um, ovarian ultrasound. They account for the majority of masses that will be seen in most clinical practices, and they have a typical appearance in the majority of cases that strongly suggest the correct diagnosis. So it's really important that you know the uh, typical appearance of these four masses. And they are the simple cysts, the hemorrhagic cysts, the endometrioma, and the dermoid, also termed mature cystic teratoma. So first we review the simple cyst. It needs the same criteria as a simple cyst in any other organ. It's anechoic, basically no perceptible wall. Uh, there's no solid component at all, and there's typically distal acoustic enhancement. So here we have an anechoic mass, no real wall. This is a rim ovarian tissue around it, and acoustic enhancement. Typical, simple adnexal cyst, in this case coming from the ovary. Now, many years ago, we used to think that we didn't get simple cysts in postmenopausal patient. I mentioned before, in premenopausal patient, if it's over three centimeters, then I would refer to it as a simple cyst. In postmenopausal patients, uh, we're generally going to follow them if they're over about a centimeter. Uh, we have learned that somewhere around 3 to 18 percent of postmenopausal women will have simple cysts in their ovaries. If we follow those simple cysts, what happens to them? Well, the, these numbers you'll see here don't add up quite to 100 percent because they're from different studies. But in general, near half will disappear, and most do so within one to two years. Another almost half, uh, 
tend to persist unchanged, and then a small percent, probably in the neighborhood of 10% or less, will increase in size. Interestingly, the ones that end up being removed surgically, and those obviously are gonna be the larger ones in most cases, the majority, about 85%, are serous cystadenomas, which are benign neoplasm. So what about the follow-up for simple cyst? From the SRU consensus conference, yearly follow-up was recommended when it was over five centimeters but less than seven in premenopausal patient and over one centimeter but less than seven in the postmenopausal patient. There are some centers that might up this number from one to perhaps two or three centimeters before following them yearly. That's not unreasonable either. You should consider that when the cyst is over seven centimeters, regardless of menopausal status, that you should think about doing MRI or consider surgical evaluation. The reason for that is um, a study that found when they're over about seven to seven point five centimeters that small solid nodules along the wall can be missed sonographically. So I think as the cyst gets larger, uh, it becomes more difficult to be confident that there's no small solid component. And as we'll talk about shortly, the solid component is the most important sonographic feature to predict malignancy. So what about the risk of malignancy in unilocular or simple cysts? First, it's important to realize that simple cysts are not necessarily the same as unilocular. We just talked about the definition of a simple cyst. However, the definition of unilocular in many studies, and including the uh, IOTA definition uh, of a unilocular cyst, allows for solid protrusions of less than three millimeters from the wall. That's considered an irregular wall and not uh, a nodule or papilla in uh, their scheme, but still qualifies as a unilocular cyst could also have internal echoes and be a unilocular cyst. So while they're sometimes the same, that is all simple cysts will be unilocular, not all unilocular cysts are simple cysts. It's important to be aware of that distinction. Since the Society of Radiologists and Ultrasound Consensus Conference, uh, there has been a study from the IOTA group that described four or 326 simple cysts, and they actually did pull out the simple cysts, not just the unilocular cysts that were malignant. They ranged in size from 4.5 to 4.8 to even 14, and those did have small papilla at pathology that were missed on ultrasound. One lesion at 5.8 centimeters had no papilla identified at path and was still malignant. So it did find a very small percent, about 1% of simple cysts that were malignant. Um, I think, you know, does this cause us to change our recommendation from the SRU consensus conference of seven millimeters, I'm sorry, seven centimeters, uh, that you should consider further evaluation. I think not. There's still good evidence that the majority of cysts that are simple, that are less than 10 centimeters, that malignancy is very unlikely. Um, so I don't think we need to change that seven centimeter uh, threshold, but I think the studies do emphasize the importance of high scan quality and looking carefully for these small nodules along the wall. So it certainly should be true for any cyst that you think is a simple cyst on ultrasound. Look carefully along the wall for any solid component. And particularly as it gets larger, make sure you look at the entire wall. And that takes a little more time to be a little more careful, uh, but there is the potential that as you get larger, it's easier to overlook small nodules that would change your characterization of that adnexal mass. So just be careful, make sure you really think it's a simple cyst. Pair ovarian simple cysts um, are common. In the SRU recommendations, they were treated the same as ovarian. One could perhaps argue that pair ovarian cysts are even less concerned than ovarian cysts. Uh, part of the difficulty is some of the original studies actually lump them together and admittedly occasionally it's hard to tell whether a simple cyst in the adnex is coming from the ovary or is outside the ovary. Um, you could perhaps make an argument that you know a three and a half centimeter simple pair ovarian cyst in a postmenopausal woman maybe doesn't need the same follow-up as an ovarian cyst. That's perhaps uh, debatable, but they were treated the same in the uh, SRU recommendations. Now, what about persistent simple ovarian cysts? 
and this is a great question, comes up a lot. So you follow these two, three years, they're stable. Can you stop following or can you change the frequency? And I don't think we know the answer to that. Uh, it probably is related uh, to some degree on cyst size. You know, I'd be le more concerned about stop, uh, to stop following a six centimeter cyst than I would a two centimeter cyst. How long? Is it just a couple of years? Is it five years? Does the patient have other risk factors? Uh, some of this is patient preference too, whether they want to keep following it. So I don't know that we know enough to say stop completely following it. I think um, unless it's the larger ones that perhaps if they've been stable for two to three years, you might decrease the frequency of follow-up. I don't think that's unreasonable but I don't think we know enough at this point to say not to follow them uh, anymore after any period of time. So the other question is how much measured size change is real? I'm not aware of a lot of data on the reproducibility of ovarian cyst measurement. I do think it's important if you think a cyst has changed in size not just to look at pure numbers but look at those images, see how it was measured, see how it was measured on the prior study, see if you think you're measuring it in similar planes before concluding whether it's changed or not. And slight differences, I, I think, are often technical um, and probably not a real change. But before you say it's really changed, I would look carefully uh, at the images and how the cyst was measured on both studies. So that's the simple cyst. The other one of the big four common benign cysts is the hemorrhagic ovarian cyst. This is typically due to hemorrhage in a corpus luteum or a follicular cyst. Majority uh, will resolve within eight weeks, sometimes sooner. Uh, there's anecdotal cases of them taking longer to resolve, but uh, in the vast majority of patients, they will resolve within about eight weeks. The typical ultrasound features is this reticular pattern of internal echoes. They're very fine linear echoes. Notice that they're not true septations. I would encourage you not to, cause, to uh, call these septations. The difference is, with these um, particular pattern, they're short linear to curved linear echoes. They don't go all the way across the cyst wall and they're not as thick as true septations. This has also been called a lacy uh, spider web pattern uh, and it's thought to be due to fibrin strands uh, due to the hemorrhage and clot. So when you see this typical appearance of a hemorrhagic cyst, you can be confident that's what you're looking at. Another feature is sometimes in hemorrhagic cysts you get a solid component if it has um, concave margins as in this one rather than bulging out it's concave in and you don't get flow in that area with color Doppler that's also suggestive of a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst. What about follow-up of typical hemorrhagic ovarian cysts? Well again most resolve within two months. Um, from the SRU consensus conference, we felt that in an asymptomatic patient, if it's less than five centimeters, you probably don't need to follow those on a routine basis. If it's over five centimeters, we suggested follow-up. We'd usually wait six to 12 weeks. Ideally, you would re-image the patient days three to 10 of the menstrual cycle, where you're less likely to get hemorrhage into another cyst or corpus luteum although admittedly it's sometimes hard to plan the follow-up uh, at that point of the menstrual cycle. What about early postmenopausal patients? Early postmenopause refers to the first five years since the final menstrual period. There is evidence that uh, women in this time frame can occasionally ovulate. I haven't seen it very often, uh, that is to see hemorrhagic cysts uh, in this time period, though admittedly you have perimenopausal patients where sometimes you're not sure which group they really fall in. But if it's in the perimenopause to early postmenopausal period, I would follow those hemorrhagic cysts uh, of any size at six to 12 weeks. Once you get five years past the final menstrual period into the so-called late postmenopausal phase, you really shouldn't have a hemorrhagic cyst anymore. And I don't think I've really encountered this, but I wouldn't be willing to accept it as a hemorrhagic cyst, even with the typical appearance, if they were over five years since the final menstrual period. And I would probably do further imaging with MRI or consider surgical evaluation. One pitfall with hemorrhagic cyst you want to be aware of is that acute to subacute clot can fool you for a solid component. Here's a big 
a mass in the ovary. It actually looks solid in the sense that it's got internal echoes, but with color Doppler, we're not seeing any flow inside of it. This should always be a tip off to you and a premenopausal patient that you may be looking at clot rather than true solid tissue of a neoplasm. So always think about this in a younger patient, a premenopausal patient, before I call a solid ovarian mass. And the lack of flow would at least suggest, doesn't prove that it's not a neoplasm, but I would give this patient uh, an interval follow-up ultrasound in six to 12 weeks to see if it resolves. Hopefully it does and you have your answer. Obviously if it's still there and looks the same in six to 12 weeks, it, uh, hemorrhagic cyst becomes very unlikely. Another common benign mass is the endometrioma. These classically have these homogeneous, low to medium level internal echoes, sometimes referred to as a ground glass appearance, without a solid component. When you see this appearance, it's very typical of an endometrioma. You may have these small echogenic foci in the wall. Uh, I talked about these earlier in a normal ovary is generally being insignificant. I'm still not certain whether they're truly in the wall or they just happen to be in the ovarian parenchyma next to the endometrioma. They have been described as a feature of endometrioma, but they are not uh, a requirement to diagnose endometrioma. So just be aware you may see them, but it's not a requirement. The main thing you're looking for with endometriomas is this homogeneous, low to medium level echoes, ground glass appearance in some terminologies. Many are unilocular, but you can't have septations. Here's one with two locules, both homogeneous internal echoes. Um, here's one that can fool you for solid mass. Uh, and I think, in my experience, this happens with the more chronic endometriomas. They're pretty homogeneous. There's actually three lesions here, and they can look like a solid mass. And I think these are just the ones that have been around longer. You get a little higher degree of internal echoes, and it can fool you for a solid mass. So I consider that when there's no internal flow detected uh, in such a lesion. What about follow-up? At any age, we generally recommend to follow-up in six to 12 weeks. This is really more important if you're considering surgical removal because there is some overlap in the appearance of endometriomas and hemorrhagic cysts. So particularly if a patient is planning to have surgical removal of endometrioma, I think at least one follow-up ultrasound beforehand in the six to 12 week range is helpful just for the uh, infrequent occurrence of a hemorrhagic cyst that might simulate an endometrioma and would resolve uh, in that time frame. If it's not surgically removed, we consider yearly follow-up to look for enlargement or develop of any solid component that would be more concerning. There is a problem area with, it, with endometriomas. Occasionally, and it happens probably in about five to 20%, you see a small nodule along the wall of what otherwise has homogeneous internal echoes. So what do you do then? Um, as we'll talk about further in a few minutes, these solid nodules are generally concerning for neoplasm and a malignant neoplasm, but we know they happen in a small percentage of endometriomas. This is a difficult area to sort out. This little hyper, slightly hyperechoic nodule could be due to clot, in which case with color power Doppler, you would not expect to see flow, but sometimes it's due to focal areas of endometrial tissue, and you could see flow in these by color power Doppler ultrasound. If you did an MR, sometimes they, they will enhance too if it's due to focal endometrial tissue. So these unfortunately occur in a minority of endometriomas. They're problematic. We know that probably most of these are still benign endometriomas. Um, but these are difficult ones to know how to manage and may end up uh, requiring surgical removal to be certain that you're not dealing with a neoplasm instead. Even though, again, the majority of these, in my experience, are still going to turn out to be endometriomas. I think the ones I've seen have typically been small solid components like this, minimally hyperechoic compared to the adjacent ovarian parenchyma or cyst wall. We know that a small percentage, 1% or less, of endometriomas can become malignant. They typically uh, evolve into an endometroid or clear cell carcinoma. Here's such an example. This one has the homogeneous echoes, but the solid component in this malignancy is much larger, more irregular than what we just saw in the benign endometriomas. So you start seeing this larger solid component. This I don't have the image available here, but did have flow by color power Doppler, then you become concerned that you're dealing with 
an endometrioma that has become malignant, or occasionally there's other malignant neoplasms that can simulate this when they have the solid component. The majority of malignancies in endometriomas are larger masses over about nine centimeters, and the patients tend to be a little older age. So certainly you should suspect malignancy if you see rapid cyst growth or development of a solid component that was not present previously. So the last of the common, uh, the big four as we referred to, common benign masses is the dermoid or mature cystic teratoma. It's been reported as the most common ovarian neoplasm. It is a benign lesion, can occur in pre or postmenopausal patients. Bilateral in 10 to 15 percent. The torsion or rupture uh, risk is small. Uh, torsion's been reported 3 to 16 percent, rupture 1 to 4 percent. I, I think these numbers are probably lower nowadays. I don't think we see even that percentage of patients with a dermoid who have torsion or rupture, but it is a small risk. The ultrasound features that are typical are focal or diffuse hyperechoic component, the hyperechoic lines and dots, which has been termed the dermoid mesh. You get areas of acoustic shadowing. You don't typically expect flow by Doppler ultrasound. And here's some examples of those. Here's a hyperechoic component, maybe faint acoustic shadowing. This had more pronounced acoustic shadowing. Here's the dermoid mesh. Here we see these little short linear echoes that actually are probably the hair fibers in a more liquid component of the dermoid. It's thought that when the hair fibers are in the more sebum or fatty part that you get a lot of interfaces, as in this part, that may cause a more uniformly hyperechoic appearance. Many dermoids will have more than one feature. If you'll notice in this one with the dermoid mesh over at the side, there's actually a hyperechoic component also, which would make you even more confident that this is a dermoid. So these three are the most typical appearances you're going to see for a dermoid. This last appearance has been described as floating fat balls or, or globules. Um, if you'll notice, this is a transabdominal scan. These little uh, spherical areas are non-dependent. That is, they're floating. It's been reported as a pathognomonic uh, appearance of dermoids. However, it's not very common. It tends to occur in larger masses, and you won't see this very often, but it probably is highly predictive when you do see it. If dermoids are not removed surgically, the SRU consensus recommendations were for yearly follow-up to look for growth. Admittedly, dermoids, if they grow, tend to do so very slowly. An average growth rate of only about one to two millimeter per year has been reported. Uh, and that's, I think, even tough to pick up, that whether our measurement accuracy is even that good. But the main point is that dermoids, if they grow, tend to do so very slowly. And you would, of course, look for a change in morphology on follow-up, too. Another appearance I just want to mention for dermoids is the fluid-fluid level. It's less common than the other appearances, uh, other than perhaps the floating uh, uh, globules, uh, which is pretty rare. This appearance is less common than the hyperechoic nodule or the dermoid mesh, but you may occasionally encounter it. The important thing about the fluid, fluid level in dermoids is what's been described as typical is that the non-dependent component, as in this, if it's the hyperechoic component, uh, so if the non-dependent fluid is hyperechoic compared to the dependent fluid, that's what's predictive of a dermoid. Unfortunately, many dermoids that have a fluid-fluid level, it's often the opposite. The non-dependent fluid can be less echogenic, and in those cases, uh, hemorrhagic cysts can do that too, so it becomes less useful. The fluid-fluid level, again, is uncommon. It's most helpful if the non-dependent area of fluid is the more echogenic fluid, as in this example. What about dermoids and malignancy? A small percentage of dermoids can also transform to malignancy. It's typically a squamous cell carcinoma. Not surprisingly, it tends to be larger masses, older patient. So what are the features that let you predict a malignant dermoid? It's actually not very clear. Um, these uh, branching structures that, if they're isoechoic rather than hyperechoic compared to the wall, have been reported. Um, as a feature to consider for malignancy. Obviously, if you, if you saw invasion into adjacent organs, that would be concerning. Another feature that may be helpful is uh, 
color power Doppler ultrasound, if you use it on the majority of dermoids, you typically don't see flow centrally, that is in the hyperechoic component or the dermoid mesh. You may see it peripherally in the wall, that's okay. But if you began to see flow in the hyperechoic central components, uh, that would be more concerning. It's been reported on common and benign dermoids. Uh, so we'll look for that if you saw flow centrally. Uh, it's not clear how predictive of malignancy that is, but I think it would be more concerning for malignancy. Again, peripheral flow only uh, is okay for dermoids. So those are the common, four common benign masses that it's really important to know their sonographic features. We'll move on to ovarian neoplasms, um, and now at least other neoplasms besides the dermoid. These are generally separated into four uh, basic groups, the epithelial neoplasms, that's the most common, and that's the group that when we talk about ovarian cancer uh, that most arise from. Then we've got the germ cell neoplasms, we've already talked about the dermoid, that's the most common one in that group. We've got the sex cord stromal neoplasms, and then the metastatic neoplasms. So for the epithelial group, uh, most are going to be serous or mucinous or endometroid, cyst adenomas or cyst adenocarcinomas. Uh, at least the serous and mucinous uh, can have a benign version, the cyst adenoma. Then we've got the clear cell carcinoma, and the Brenner tumor is in this epithelial group. It's a less common uh, a tumor. Most of these epithelial neoplasms have a complex cystic appearance, that is, they have both cystic and solid components. There's also the borderline uh, or low malignant potential group, which is malignant but has less stromal invasion. They may metastasize still, but they tend, these patients have a better prognosis than the frankly malignant uh, tumors. Current thinking is that there's probably two types of epithelial ovarian cancer. They may actually arise outside the ovary. Type 1 is thought to have a more indolent course, earlier stage at diagnosis, and perhaps arises from precursor lesions such as endometriosis. The type 2 is the more aggressive form, more advanced stage typically at diagnosis, and may be the reason that screening has been difficult in some of the studies, that these have a very short lead time. Uh, develop rapidly and become advanced very quickly, and these actually may develop in the fallopian tube rather than the ovary itself. So what are the ultrasound features that make us most concerned for these malignant neoplasms, particularly that epithelial group? Well, it's a solid nodule that has blood flow by Doppler ultrasound, as in this patient who has a cystic mass, there's a septation, there's a lobular solid component, and there is blood flow within it. Just to mention one thing about blood flow, if you see a length of a vessel, as in this example, I think that's adequate for saying that there's flow in that solid tissue. If you only see a dot or two of color, that is a pixel or two of color, um, it's important, I think, that you put on spectral Doppler uh, to make sure you see an arterial venous waveform. If it's just a couple of dots of color without seeing a distinct vessel, that could be noise. And since it's important to know whether there's blood flow detected in that solid area, just be careful when you don't see a distinct vessel and put on that spectral Doppler if it's only a few pixels of flow and see if you get a typical arterial or venous waveform. So again, the solid nodule with blood flow is the feature with, uh, that's most concerning, has the highest likelihood for malignancy. Focal wall thickening, at least more than three millimeters, is considered similar to this uh, as, as a solid component. The other things concerning is thick septations or irregular septations. Here we have a cystic mass with a few septations that are a little over three millimeters. They're slightly irregular here, uh, and this was also uh, a malignant uh, epithelial neoplasm, ovarian cancer. So these type lesions are pretty easy to characterize. We know they're very likely to be malignant. You really don't need to do any other imaging in most of these patients to characterize the mass. You may need to do other imaging such as CT for staging, but generally if it's got a solid component or thick, thick irregular septations with blood flow, that's concerning enough for malignancy uh, alone. What about the germ cell neoplasm group? We already talked about the dermoid or mature cystic teratoma. There are some rare subtypes such as the struma ovarii where thyroid tissue predominates. Uh, those actually don't always have the typical dermoid look on ultrasound and may end up having a nonspecific appearance. Uh, 
Uh, Dysgerminoma, yolk sac, or endodermal sinus tumors are also in this group, as are embryonal cell and chorial carcinoma. Those are less frequent. The only other one we're going to mention uh, today is the dysgerminoma. Uh, it's an uncommon malignant tumor, though generally a good prognosis. If you see a lobulated, solid mass, pretty well-defined borders, it can have plenty of flow by Doppler, and a younger patient less than about 30 years old, that's a typical appearance of dysgerminoma. So I would consider that as a, a likely diagnosis if you encounter such a large solid mass uh, in a younger patient. Uh, obviously the patient will probably still need histologic proof, uh, but I would consider dysgerminoma as the most likely diagnosis in that instance. The sex cord stromal group uh, also has several subtypes. These are the four most common um, We'll talk about fibromas and thecomas. Uh, granulosa cell we're really not gonna go into. However, granulosa cell uh, is the one that can secrete estrogen. Uh, different tumors can, can secrete hormones, but the, the uh, classic one that secretes estrogen is the granulosa cell tumor, and these some patients uh, also have endometrial abnormalities, including endometrial cancer because of the high estrogen levels. In my experience, most of those are solid, though the literature would say that they can be both cystic and solid, particularly when larger. I'll just mention also the Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. Many of these uh, small ones, um, or many are small, solid masses, they can secrete androgens. This is the typical one that can cause virilization by secreting androgens uh, in about a third of the cases. And these can be difficult to identify because they're small solid lesions. Uh, the main ones, the more common ones we're going to talk about in this group are the fibromas and the thecomas. They often coexist. Uh, the appearance is probably similar. So the, for the fibromas, uh, these are benign neoplasms. They're most common in middle age, 40 to 50 to 60 year old patients. Uh, they're typically solid, generally completely solid. They can be heterogeneous as in this case and be solid. They can be more homogeneous and solid. And also a typical appearance is marked attenuation of sound. You can actually overlook the mass because you might think it's shadowing from bowel gas. Uh, but this occurs in a minority of fibromas, but it is pretty predictive when you see it. It's different from acoustic shadowing from say calcification or dermoid. Because if you'll notice here, this acoustic shadowing, where is it coming from? Well, with calcification or a dermoid, you expect to see a hyperechoic area from which the acoustic shadowing originates. Here, it basically just looks like, if you will, a black hole. It just all of a sudden there's acoustic shadowing, there's no hyperechoic lead point. Uh, and that's a tip off that you may be dealing with one of these fibromas that has marked attenuation of sound. Uh, and again, the thecomas can look similar. They often uh, coexist histologically uh, in the same mass. So this brings up another topic that it's important to know how to approach, and that's when you have a solid adnexal mass that is completely solid. If it's completely solid and ovarian in origin, you're probably dealing with the neoplasm, and in the appropriate age group, I'd think about the ovarian fibroma as the most likely uh, cause. Now, some studies have suggested that solid masses uh, increase the risk for malignancy. Part of the difficulty there is that in most of those studies, the definition of solid allowed for up to a 20% cystic component. So, um, and certainly yes, some of those with the more cystic component have a, a higher chance of being malignant. In my experience, the completely solid mass, that is with no cystic component, particularly if you're dealing with a patient who's 40, 50, to six, perhaps 60 years old, the majority of those are gonna be the benign fibroma. Admittedly, they'll still typically need surgical evaluation to confirm that, uh, but I think the completely solid masses are often benign. So it's important to consider alternative diagnoses other than just an ovarian origin when you're faced with a patient who has a completely solid adnexal mass. What else do we consider? Well, pedunculated fibroids are the main one. Fibroids are just so common and if they're pedunculated uh, off the uterus, protruding out into the adnexa, they can simulate um, an ovarian mass. And this is particularly problematic if you cannot identify the ovary uh, on the side of the solid adnexal mass. The thing that can be helpful here is to look for the vascular pedicle by Doppler ultrasound connecting the mass to the uterus. Uh, 
Other things that I always like to consider before I, I attribute a solid adnexal mass as an ovarian cause is that subacute hemorrhage exists that we talked about earlier. It can simulate a solid mass, so just be suspicious in these younger patients where it looks solid and there's no flow detected in it. Think about that chronic endometrioma that might simulate a truly solid ovarian neoplasm, and MRI could be helpful in these patients. And this is an instance where if you're really unsure of the origin of the solid adnexal mass, that is particularly when you cannot find the ovary on that side by ultrasound, that MRI uh, is often helpful. So here's a case, a solid adnexal mass, and this is an example of using a color Doppler to see that connecting vessel between the uterus and the mass, confirming that you're looking at the pedicle of a pedunculated fibroid. Because if you think about most pedunculated fibroids, um, do we see the pedicle with grayscale ultrasound? Typically not. You may occasionally, uh, if you look, look hard and get a little bit lucky, you may find it in grayscale. But I think that color power Doppler addition is what really helps you find the, the pedicle in a pedunculated fibroid and be confident of the diagnosis. If you don't see the connecting pedicle, it might still be a fibroid. Maybe you just didn't find it but you certainly would have to proceed then to uh, either MRI or consider surgical evaluation if you cannot confirm that it's a pedunculated fibroid by ultrasound. The last general group of neoplasms to the ovary is the metastatic group. What are the most common primaries to metastasize to the ovary? Well, breast and GI tract are probably the biggest ones. With breast cancer, it's typically the patients with more advanced disease. Colon and stomach are also high up the list as primary uh, sites that metastasize to the ovary. Um, as we'll talk about in just a moment, many of these are thought to be solid masses. There's some evidence that mets from colon cancer are more likely to be cystic than other primary tumors. Uh, and then, of course, you know, many primary tumors have been described. Uh, breast GI tract are the most common. Lymphoma and endometrial cancer have also been described. Can we really distinguish a primary from a metastatic neoplasm? It's not clear how good we are at that. Uh, a traditional teaching for many years is that solid and bilateral favors metastatic. It was certainly true in this patient who had a predominantly solid mass in the right ovary and the left. This was metastatic from gastric carcinoma. So in my experience, they often are solid and bilateral, but we know from the literature that's not always true. Uh, and in some cases, it will be difficult to know whether you're dealing with a primary or a metastatic uh, lesion. Uh, trying to find the primary cause uh, may be helpful uh, in those instances. So now we're gonna move on to masses outside the ovary because it's important when you see a mass in the adnexin to not assume it's coming from the ovary. Admittedly, most will come from the ovary, but if it's extra ovarian, we're gonna be thinking about different causes, so always try to you know, determine whether the mass you're looking at is truly coming from the ovary or not. Here's an example of a cyst. You can see a rim of ovary around it. Perhaps some would call this a claw sign where you got this little rim or claw of ovarian tissue going around the edge. Uh, and so if we see that ovarian tissue around it, you could be confident it's coming from the ovary. And in the premenopausal patient, those small follicles in the ovarian parenchyma can help you. If it's not ovarian, sometimes it's obvious, as in this case, here we've got an ovary with a follicle, a few of those insignificant echogenic foci. Here's this perovarian cyst sitting off to the side. So sometimes it's easy, it's obvious that the lesion you're looking at is separate from the ovary. If it's not obviously coming from the ovary, it is important to try to tell its origin uh, you can use gentle transducer pressure with a transvaginal transducer or your non-scanning hand on the patient's abdomen and see if you can separate the lesion from the ovary. That can be helpful in some patients. If you don't find the ovary at all, then sometimes it is more difficult. Uh, I do think it's important to not only look transvaginally, but to look transabdominally, even without a full bladder, to at least look briefly because sometimes the ovary is superiorly positioned in the pelvis and you may only see it on transabdominal scanning. So when we're faced with an extra ovarian mass, what are the things we consider? Well, I've kind of put them into mostly cystic, mostly solid, and the more common and the less common. We're only gonna talk about the more common ones. So for the mostly cystic extra ovarian mass, the more common lesions are the perovarian cysts, hydrosalpinks, and the peritoneal inclusion cysts. 
The perovarian or paratubal, I'll use the term synonymously because uh, we can't always tell the difference, but it's mainly you're seeing a simple cyst in the adnexa that's separate from the ovary. These are usually simple cysts, meet the same definition of a simple cyst we talked about earlier. And in this case, where it's just sitting right next to the ovary, it's an easy diagnosis to make. These are pretty common, small ones we may overlook because of bowel gas, uh, but these are generally of little to no significance. What about the hydrosalpines? When do we suggest that diagnosis? Well, obviously a tubular shape, as in this case, an incomplete septation, the waste sign, and these small nodules, also called beads on a string, have been described. So. Uh, just to go back to this one, here's our tubular shape. This incomplete septation, it's not a true septation in most uh, instances. It's really just the wall of the distended fallopian tube as it folds back on itself simulates an incomplete septation. It was originally reported as pathognomonic. It's since been found not to be. You can occasionally see these in other uh, etiologies. But, in fact, if it's tubular shaped, and has an incomplete septation. I think those frequently are hydrosalpinges. Another feature that's been described as perhaps one of the best signs is the so-called waste sign. And this refers to this indentation along opposite sides. It's like a waste. Uh, it it's kind of indents the, cy the cystic structure on opposite sides. And that's the waste sign. And that's a very useful feature for identifying hydrosalpinks also. So that tubular shaped cystic mass with the waste sign, look for that. The other thing to be aware of with the hydrosalpinks is these small mural nodules. It's been called beads on a string. You know, here's a cystic mass, little nodules there. Um, we'll see it here on the video clip on the same patient. This tubular shaped mass, you see these little nodules along the wall here. Um, if you did not recognize that this lesion was outside the ovary and you had these small nodules, you might confuse it for an ovarian neoplasm. But we know that hydrosalpinges can have these small nodules. They are thought to be due to the thickened endosalpingeal folds uh, that become inflamed in the hydrosalpinks. So if you see these small, nodulars, small nodules in what otherwise looks like a hydrosalpinks, that's okay. You don't have to be concerned about malignancy. Fallopian tube neoplasm uh, is admittedly uncommon. It can have solid components. In my experience, they're typically larger solid components, not these tiny nodules along the wall. Peritoneal inclusion cyst, um, also been referred to as peritoneal pseudocyst. It's thought that you need two things to have one, a functioning ovary and adhesions. The most common risk factors for adhesions are surgery, endometriosis, and pelvic inflammatory disease. So the ultrasound features are it's typically a septated cystic mass, and you look for it extending around the ovary or the ovary suspended within it. They also frequently conform to the shape of adjacent structures. So here's a cystic mass, kind of a thick irregular septation on transabdominal scanning, but when we look transvaginally, you can actually see the ovary inside the cystic mass. And this was a peritoneal inclusion cyst in a patient with endometriosis. So always consider that option when I've got a septated cystic mass, they have risk factors for adhesions, look and try to find that ovary somewhere within it and that can help you make the diagnosis. Now mostly solid extra ovarian masses, we've already talked about this, pedunculated fibroid is by far the most common entity that you'll deal with. Uh, occasionally fibroids, as we know, can have cystic degeneration, you know, this one's solid, but here's one with cystic degeneration. This, if you didn't know the origin, would be very difficult to distinguish from ovarian carcinoma because it mentally has got cystic components, irregular solid components. Whether fibroid or ovarian neoplasm, it could have flow. This was a pedunculated fibroid with cystic degeneration that simulated uh, ovarian carcinoma. So just be aware of that. And again, try to look for that vascular pedicle that we looked at earlier. Admittedly, if it has cystic degeneration, that may be a little more problematic and making a confident diagnosis if you're not able to find the ipsilateral ovary. Now we're going to shift to cysts that have indeterminate features. We talked about the benign features. We talked about the malignant features. Occasionally there's cysts that are more problematic. Um, and there's four general groups. Two of them are less concerning. Two of them are a little bit more concerning. Um, the one that's less concerning is what I like to call the almost simple cyst. And that is it has one thin septation or it has a little calcification along the wall with nothing else. 
These we recommend following similar to simple cysts uh, in the ovary. Occasionally you get these cysts that have some features that might look like a little bit like one of these benign ones that we talked about. For instance, you know, it's a little hyperechoic here, but gee, am I really confident that's a dermoid. Or here's one, it's a little heterogeneous, and I'm thinking it has that reticular pattern of a hemorrhagic cyst, but it's not quite classic. So, you know, these have features that make me think uh, perhaps a dermoid, make me think perhaps a hemorrhagic cyst, but I'm not confident enough to be sure. Uh, and these are the ones that would probably follow up with ultrasound in 6 to 12 weeks, particularly in a premenopausal patient. If it persists unchanged in 6 to 12 weeks, then a hemorrhagic cyst is very unlikely, and I would do further evaluation at that time. The features that um, are a little more concerning and indeterminate are the multiple thin septations and the solid nodule, that is a non hyperechoic solid nodule without flow. Then we think about neoplasm more, though usually benign neoplasms such as a cyst adenofibroma. So here's an patient with multiple septations. There's different degrees of echogenicity in the various septations. That actually is typical of a mucinous cyst adenoma. Uh, and another patient with a small solid nodule along the wall without detectable flow in a patient with a cyst adenofibroma. So these are features that are indeterminate, uh, but again, probably are going to be benign, but we certainly can't be confident. We're going to have to do further evaluation or consider surgical evaluation. All right. And these uh, recommendations were summarized in the report of the Adnexal Cyst Consistent Conference that was published uh, in radiology with Dr. Uh, Debbie Levine as the lead author. So those are available and we keep those up in our reading room and refer to them frequently. A couple of miscellaneous lesions just to mention in closing, the tubo ovarian abscess and adnexal mass is unique to pregnancy. The tubo ovarian abscess or TOA as it's often called can really have a variety of appearances. There's typically nothing suggestive enough based on the ultrasound appearance alone. They have cystic and solid components, internal echoes, they can simulate a neoplasm, they can simulate a hemorrhagic cyst. One feature that may help you sonographically is if you see a tubular cystic component that would make you consider fallopian tube, that is a hydrosalpinx or a pyosalpinx because it's got internal echoes, that could suggest that you're dealing with a tubo ovarian abscess. Otherwise, the appearance Again, it's quite variable, and it's really the clinical setting uh, of pelvic inflammatory disease that helps point to the correct diagnosis. So again, other than perhaps seeing a hydrosal, uh, hydrosalpinx or pyosalpinx component, I think it's difficult to confidently diagnose the tubal ovarian abscess by ultrasound alone. You really need clinical information. I want to mention a few adnexal masses unique to pregnancy in closing. They are the thecal luteal cyst, decidualized endometrioma, and the luteoma of pregnancy. The thecaludean cysts are typically bilateral, uh, septated masses, multiple thin septations. It can simulate a multiloculated neoplasm. Uh, these uh, basically occur with high serum beta HCG levels. Uh, I think it's the bilateral nature and appearance of these when it occurs uh, with a known association. And the most common associations are gestational trophoblastic disease. Um, it's certainly the most common one we think about. Ovarian hyperstimulation uh, and patients have undergone uh, in vitro uh, fertilization or other types of assisted reproductive techniques have a similar appearance. Uh, and then occasionally patients with multiple pregnancy or high drops can also get these. That's sometimes referred to as hyperreactive luteinalis. It's a variably used term, but sometimes used when patients have these thecaludean cysts in the absence of trophoblastic disease and the absence of ovulation induction. Decidualized endometrioma is uncommon, uh, but certainly important to consider as it can simulate uh, malignancy. It's typically cystic with a solid component. We have the patient with an endometrioma that has the ectopic endometrial tissue in it, and when they're pregnant, the endometrial tissue can grow and appear similar to the solid component of a neoplasm. Here's a patient, it has that homogeneous echoes like many endometriomas do, but this has got a kind of lobulated, irregular, solid component, has some blood flow in it, so we would have to be concerned about malignancy in a patient like this. But she's pregnant and she has known endometriosis, and this actually was a decidualized endometrioma. That was path proven, uh, ended up being removed uh, 
but can you make a confident diagnosis so that the patient can avoid surgery? It can be challenging. Um, Doppler imaging probably isn't reliable as the decidualized endometrioma can have flow in the solid areas. It doesn't necessarily mean it's malignant. I think the reasons to suspect this diagnosis are if the patient has known endometriosis, particularly a known endometrioma, no other features of malignancy, and if on follow-up, you know, it doesn't change or it actually they occasionally decrease in size, that's also suggestive. But admittedly, uh, this just requires a high index of suspicion and can be confident to make, uh, a, uh, can be difficult to make a confident diagnosis uh, in these patients, but you should at least consider it, particularly when the patient has known endometriosis. Can MRI help? Perhaps it may uh, show other features typical of an endometrioma. There's been some suggestion that the signal intensity of the solid parts similar to endometrium, that's supportive. We're probably not gonna give gadolinium during pregnancy. So the MRI can give you some at least supportive evidence, but uh, again, it's gonna be difficult to make a confident diagnosis. Uh, lastly, the luteoma of pregnancy uh, is a very rare lesion. There's really no specific ultrasound appearance, uh, though it's typically solid. The tip-off here is maternal virilization, that if you have hirsutism, elevated androgens, that's a typical of luteoma of pregnancy. So it's really not so much the imaging appearance, but the associated clinical finding of maternal virilization that suggests luteoma of pregnancy. So just to sum up, I think that the key points are that it's important to understand what's normal and not to consider it a cyst or mass, and that gets back to what we call a follicle or a corpus luteum. Please don't call it a cyst. Um, when you're faced with an adnexal mass, don't assume it's ovarian. Really try to determine whether it's arising from the ovary or is extra ovarian in origin because that will certainly change your differential diagnosis. It's important to know the common ultrasound appearances of these benign lesions, the four I mentioned, the simple cyst, the hemorrhagic cyst, the endometrioma, and the dermoid, because those are the most common lesions you're likely to encounter, and they frequently have one of those typical appearances. And then lastly, the cystic mass that has a solid component with flow is the most predictive feature for malignancy. Thank you.